bathe problem at the beginning of, or at the end of class last time. We're going to carry all the way through that analysis. And I'm going to show you some illustrations as to what is going on so you can get kind of a, you know, an illustrated look at Bayesian analysis, how it sequentially adapts to data, so on and so forth. Before we do that, I'd like to get some review sessions down for the remainder of this class. I'm going to take the top two slots as tentative review hours. I know that some of you won't be able to make certain of these, so that's why I want to pick two different slots as well. So if there is a conflict and you get hit with both slots you can't make it to, let me know. And so we'll improvise. Who wants it on Tuesday? And I should mention, let's go for 6.30 p.m. If we need to move the hour, then maybe we can do that as well. So earlier doesn't really work because it's hard to get a room. And so I'd like to do everything just back in this room if I can. So Tuesday, 6.30, raise your hands if you'd like that. Should you vote twice? <coughs> What's that? Should you vote twice? You can vote twice. I don't really care. Okay, Tuesday. So. Okay, so you can vote twice if you'd like. So throw up your hands, let me count them. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 10, 11, 12, 13. Okay, Wednesdays. Throw up your hands so I can count them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Is there a 12? So, Thursday. And this one I have a hard lock on 6.30 or after. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So, as a statistician, I always think, are these numbers all that different? There's literally a bigger one. And so, does it mean anything? Is this random? Is there, I, is there anybody that cannot make Thursday at 6.30 after? We've got one, two. So, you gentlemen, three. Um, is there a time that you can do on Thursday? Is 7 o'clock more preferable? You're just out. I got class 6.30 to 7.45. Is that your story? <coughs> Okay, um, is there anybody that absolutely cannot make Wednesday? One, two, three, four, same reason, right? So let me just write down, three right here, four right here. Anybody that absolutely cannot make Tuesday? Okay, same as the, okay, but Dan, you only have a Thursday class, not a Tuesday, interesting. Let me get those hands again. One, two, three, four, five. Five cannot make this. These, I think, are our winners. If we shuffle between those two, we won't have conflict. What we might do to kick things off, and this is always an experiment for me, is maybe Sierra will do one, I'll do one, and then we'll alternate. And so maybe we can do that. And so we'll be doing this either on a weekly or bi-weekly schedule, depending on the meeting. So I'm going to pick those Wednesday and Thursdays, 6.30 p.m. review sessions. We'll start up in about a week. I'm not sure if we'll do next week. Sierra, can you send me a note on that? Yeah. Just a reminder so I can remember what I just agreed to. So 6.30 p.m. on both, Wednesday, Thursday. Great. Any disgruntlement? Fantastic. That's a rarity. Thanks, you guys. That's the hardest part of the whole semester for me. We will be coming up with midterms as well, the midterm date. So we have one midterm. I always like to schedule it around Halloween. And so I get your preference on it. If you have conferences that are coming up around that period, send me a note, let me know. And so we'll make sure that everybody can be in class. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick one of these two slots, and if it's the three, if I pick this one, the three gentlemen that couldn't make it, I'll set up something separate for you. Make it all work, you guys. The other option is to do it in class, the midterm, and the only difference is 50 minutes versus two hours. And so I'm going to probably write the same exam. So what I'm trying to encourage you to do is want to take this in the evening session. It's easier for you guys, probably easier for me as well. Okay, let's get back to business.
So I want to get back to this beta binomial question that we are studying, but let's just treat this very generally. So let's take a step backwards and just consider a very general inference question. And so maybe this is guessing, but really I like to think of it as learning. And so it's a better word for guess. It sounds like you're a little bit more certain. You've done something to create your guess. And so what do we get? We get data. And so I'm going to stipulate you get n data points right here. And so I sample from this distribution. So this little tilde, squiggle, means that you sample. And so what that means is if f looks like this, fx given theta, so this says given theta, and these right here are your parameters that you would like to learn. This is the, the typical parametric base setup. So parameters in a model, I want to learn them, I get to see data. So to sample from this, let's say the density looks something like this. This is x. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to reach into this curve and I'm going to grab a number. And I'm more likely to grab numbers in the regions where the curve is high. That's what it means to sample. And that's what this density represents. They are the weights in which you're inclined to sample. Okay, this is on a continuum scale, so, but ultimately, if you want to just break this up into discrete parts and making them very refined and very, very small, using the term weight would be correct on an element. Of course, we know calculus, and we're going to take that idea to a limit and get the density. And so, maybe I grab an element right there, my first draw. And so, maybe I grab an element over here on my second draw. And I just keep drawing numbers. And if I drew a whole bunch of numbers, then I would get a histogram representation of this curve that converged very well to this continuum, this continuous curve. If I just get a few numbers, they might represent this very well. They might. If I only get like two or three numbers from F, I'm not going to have a very good histogram representation of the curve, and it would be very difficult for me to learn theta. So ultimately, how big does n need to be before you can learn theta has to do with how complex that curve is, and basically how well can you approximate the shape of that curve. So loosely speaking, that's the name of the game. We need enough data to tell us where the mass of the curve lives, and then we'll try to figure out what are the guiding parameters, theta. So that's a general inference question. We're going to be Bayesians about that. We need two things. There's really two ingredients in every Bayesian analysis. What are they? You guys got them. And those are exchangeable ideas as well. So likelihood and prior or prior and likelihood. Either way, you need both of them. If you're Bayesian, you've got both things. In some of the more advanced Bayesian strategies, you need to approximate F. You need to start to learn what F is instead of you know, having it out of the gates. In my class, a lot of times, I'll tell you what F is. You get to use that information. You know what the distribution is. But in practice, you might have to build that. So that's a little bit of a difference between reality and classroom. So a lot of times I'm going to hand you that and tell you what it is. You don't have to model it. Okay, the likelihood. So how do I get this? I can make this very easy if I say these are IID realizations. So they're simple random samples. They're independent and identically distributed. So that means my influence on getting a particular data point doesn't depend on any other data point that I've already collected, given knowledge of theta. So if I know theta, I can do this. If I know theta, I can write down that curve and actually sample from everything. And so this specific curve has some set of fixed thetas. So I'm going to get those, and I'm going to be able to write down the likelihood. So if I'm IID, everything is simple. The likelihood looks like this. And so it looks, I'll say, likelihood theta given all of my data, x, I'll write this down as x1 
to XN. So it's the array of all of my data that I've collected. And this is going to be proportional to the product of all of these functions as a function of theta, where I'm going to plug in my sample data. These are observed. This right here is variable. And that's why I prefer this notation over here, right here. If I look at it, it tells me what's fixed over to the right-hand side, and it tells me what's variable. However, on the chalkboard, if I didn't know what was fixed or variable, I wouldn't know how to conceptualize this thing. Is it a sampling density of all of that joint data, or is it a function of my parameters, i.e., a likelihood with the data plugged in? And so it really is that conception that changes it from a sampling density to a likelihood. So I'll usually use this notation, but don't be surprised if you see people using this notation, fx given theta to represent a likelihood. And they'll say, this is a likelihood. And they'll say, well, the notation you've selected makes it look more like a sampling distribution, but I get your point. Sometimes they'll write likelihood like this. I don't like that because it doesn't make the bar the operator that I believe that it is. Why do people sometimes prefer these notations? Because it looks like Bayes' theorem. Yes. It looks like Bayes' theorem on paper. It's still the same formula. Just understand what we're talking about when we say likelihood. And be flexible to all the various notations people use. I'll try to stick with this one throughout the class. So if it's IID, I can just product everything together. <coughs> if they're not IID data, you would have to tell me the mechanism in which they're attached to each other. I'd probably have to have other data on the right-hand side over here to indicate that it's not IID, that there's some relationship. And it would be some sort of product that we would probably end up getting. We'll work through non-IID cases later in the class. But for now, even if I don't say it, I mean IID. So if I don't indicate what assumption I'm making, I'm going to assume IID. I'll be specific in the cases where we're building independence. So here's my likelihood function. And ultimately, I need a prior. And I'm going to represent that as pi theta. And if I don't tell you anything about f, the nature of the data, or what the parameters mean, I have no idea how to pick a prior. So I don't have any guiding lights. So the nature of the parameters is somehow going to determine what kind of priors I should use. We have to ask questions, what are the properties of those priors? And what are we trying to learn very, very clearly? And so you change the properties that you're after, you might change the prior that you'll need. Okay. So that's the basic setup. The posterior distribution. So Result is posterior pi theta given x. And this is just going to be a product name of the likelihood times the prior. It's proportional to that. If I wanted to know what it's exactly equal to, I just need to normalize it. I need to normalize it. Or, more precisely, the posterior distribution is equal to the likelihood given x pi theta over integral pi theta given x, or likelihood of theta given x pi theta the prior integrate over theta. When I integrate over theta using this notation, I do mean that I'm integrating over the whole world of theta. I'm integrating theta out of the space. And so I usually won't write that down. If I don't tell you the bounds, I mean you're integrating over its entire space. I don't mean an indefinite integral. So you integrate over the region in which theta lives. So let me just ask you a question. Is the denominator a function of theta? 
It is not. Beta is gone from that equation. I've integrated it away. And so we're building a distribution on theta, and the only thing that depends on theta are these two creatures right here. So the denominator is acting as a normalization constant, making it so that if I integrate over entire theta on the posterior, it integrates to 1. And so the important bits are right there. All I need are the likelihood of the prior. So let's look at a concrete example. Let's go back to the example that we were illustrating in the last two lectures. So example, they're going to be xi's are coming from a beta distribution, or I should say a Bernoulli distribution, with parameter p. So this is a coin flipping model. And I'm going to see some number of point flips, n of them. Now we discussed, instead of writing this down, I could maybe just say, how many successes did I see in all n coin flips? And I can write down this statistic. Some of the xi's are going to be Bernoulli. Or I should say binomial. with parameters n and p. And I should make reference to the xi being either a 1 or a 0. So I've encoded these. This is going to happen with probability p. And this happens with probability 1 minus p. So that's our setup. I said it doesn't matter which statistic you use, either the whole vector of xi or the sum of the xi because some of the xi is minimally sufficient for learning p. That means it has the minimal dimensionality that you can come up with, and it still has all the information about p. So how do we kind of learn that? Well, we write down the likelihood function, and you can kind of see it. Likelihood, you should write down, is L p given all of my data, it's going to be proportional to product 1 goes to n, p to the xi, 1 minus p to the 1 minus xi. If I plug in all of my xi's into this equation, that is the likelihood function. It's a function of p. This can be reduced to this. could be written down this way. Now, on the chalkboard, it doesn't matter which way you write this down. It's kind of a nice artifact that all I really need to know is the sums of the xi's, and I don't need to know the xi's. That's what makes it minimally sufficient. I'm kind of rolling the factorization theorem in my head. So if you want to know more about that, 5114 is your course. Um, But it's more than just a general artifact that all I need to know is the sum of the xi's. It's very useful in practice. The question is, is why? So my answer that I always come back to is computation. And so would I rather, in every iteration of my code, evaluate this product or evaluate this function right here? And I can do this much, much faster if I have stored <coughs> some of the xi's. I'm not summing them up at every step. And so I have to store less and I have to compute less. So this idea of minimal sufficiency that was come up with about 100 years ago is very practical to me. And so I like to use the easiest rep representation because it means I have to do less flops on my computer. OK, either way, we've got a likelihood function. Also, I should mention, if you had a whole bunch of terms in here, and you were trying to evaluate p's that were really, really small or very big, this product's very unstable numerically. However, this thing is very stable numerically. You can make it even more stable numerically by taking logarithms of it, working on that scale. Why is this one not stable? Because it's producting. Oh. So sums are stable. 
on computers and products are not. So products shrink very fast or they grow very fast. So sums, you know, shrink and grow moderately. Okay. So I need a prior also to complete this analysis. Let's just talk about this other possibility right here. I could have written down the likelihood for P given all of my data. This is going to be proportional to N choose some of the XIs. These are all possible ways that I can rearrange the ones and zeros, and it doesn't matter because they're IID, so they're exchangeable. P to the sum of the XIs, 1 minus P to the N minus sum of the XIs. And I'm stipulating it doesn't matter which form I actually use. You'll notice that this is not a function of P. It's a different normalizing constant. It just represents the number of rearrangements of ones and zeros that I can't distinguish that have the same sum as that number right there. Okay, so to be a Bayesian, we need a prior. So prior. We'll discuss this in just a moment. So I'll write it down as pi P. And then to conclude, we're going to multiply these things together. So we've my posterior distribution on P. This is going to be equal to my likelihood function times my product. And I'm going to normalize it. Let's plug in things and see what happens when we use these two different representations. So this is going to be our likelihood function, p to the sum of the xi's, 1 minus p, n minus sum of the xi's, times pi p, divided by <coughs> integral p, sum of the xi's, 1 minus p, n minus sum of the xi's times pi p dp. Okay, this may or may not be a hard calculation. We may or may not be able to solve it depending on what we choose for pi p. That's kind of what prevented a lot of people from being Bayesians all through the 60s and 70s, 80s. You might not know what that integral is. It might be high dimensional. In our case, it's one dimensional. We could attack it with a number of numerical techniques or Monte Carlo techniques, but back in the 60s, that wasn't readily available. So the computing just to do those common practice calculations nowadays didn't exist back then. I hope you'll recognize that if I use this as the likelihood, instead of the version coming from the Bernoulli representation, that I would have had n choose some x here, and choose some x here. And they would cancel each other out. And so I've always said likelihoods are defined up to proportionality. And they are. Likelihoods are self-relative to each other. So when I write a likelihood curve and I say the likelihood of this value is 4, that doesn't mean anything. It's compared to what? And so I can take two values from a likelihood curve and I can divide them by each other and come up with how much more likely is something compared to something else. So they're self-relative. So I can multiply this by any constant, positive constant. And they cancel out of that equation. So ultimately, Bayesians take advantage of this and they say if you use the likelihood principle and you're just doing your calculations based off of likelihood, everything will go really well. However, you're, you're computing p-values from things that have the like, same likelihood. There's no necessity that you'll get answers that agree. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But this is kind of a cool thing that if I had different stopping rules for how I collected the data, the end data points, it would ultimately vanish because the normalizing constant is the only part of the representation of the change. Okay, more on that later. So we need to discuss priors. Still don't have one. 
And so the prior is supposed to do a number of things. It's supposed to give me good properties in the posterior, meaning I can use the posterior distribution to estimate the truth, come up with intervals. I want it to converge to something that locks down the truth as fast as possible. And I want it to stabilize my inferences when there's low sample sizes. So I want the prior to do a lot of things. I want it to regularize my regular regularize my space. I've caught the bugs here. So regularize my space. So what do I mean? I mean that when there's just a little bit of data in the system, your inferences can change all over the place really quickly. And so you want to settle that down a little bit. And so prior has the ability to do that. The likelihood function gives me the ability to jointly infer everything. In our case, we just have a one-dimensional analysis, so there's no joint inference. But the likelihood gives me the ability to understand things jointly. The prior gives me the ability to encode information, regularize my space. I get convergence properties out of it, so on and so forth. We need to choose a sensible choice. I'm not going to suggest we need an optimal choice, but I need a choice that is at least good enough to learn what he is relatively fast. So what would you pick? A beta. So there's a, like a key on the board, right? So I said something about this. So maybe a beta. Betas look like this. So I'll say pi p would be proportional to, so there's a normalizing constant in here, p to the alpha minus 1, 1 minus p to the beta minus 1. I should be real polite about this and probably tell you that there's parameters that underline this distribution. So these are parameters that dictate the prior. These have special names. These are called hyperparameters. Now, for one reason or another, Bayesians are not very polite and they'll usually skip telling you about those. They might be the most important part of the analysis. So if we pick numbers in there that really steer the analysis and doesn't let the data have it say, we're in trouble. And so it's always a good question to ask, what are these hyperparameters? Every prior has them. But sometimes we omit to tell you, and we just write that down as notation. Okay, we'll have lots of discussions about hyperchoices, hyperparameter choices, so on and so forth. We'll have a little bit of discussion today. Maybe I don't want to muck around with any of that. I don't know what alpha and beta are. I don't know anything about beta distributions. What would another choice be? Uniform beta. Maybe a uniform. So maybe pi p is equal to a uniform on 0, 1. Any other choices? Gaussian beta. What's that? Gaussian? Yeah, Gaussian. Okay, you're going to have to at least lock me down between 0 and 1. So, first thing I always check in a prior is, does the space it cover cover where the parameters are determined to live by the sampling distribution, by whatever my model is? And so, Gaussian fails that test. And so, when I do ask you guys to pick priors, I'm going to be looking for that. So, if you say like gamma, I'm going to say not a great choice because it lives between 0 and infinity. Whereas Gaussian lives between minus infinity and infinity. Now you might say, well, I'm going to truncate it. But then I'm going to ask you, how did you center it and what's your variance? Those would be your hyperparameters that you would have to choose. So not a great choice because it doesn't really match the, the nature of the problem. These distributions naturally live between 0 and 1. And so both of these, P is an element of 0, 1. So decent choices. Turns out the uniform is a subcase of the beta distribution. So note, uniform, 0, 1, is equal to a beta, 1, 1. So if I plugged in these two parameters, 1 and 1, for alpha and beta, Specific. Alpha is equal to 1 and beta is equal to 1. 
This would flatten this thing out. You might not know what this looks like. We'll see it in a second in my simulations. But if this is one, and that's one, then these are both raised to the power of zero, which makes them one. And so what's the normalization constant that I need to normalize it? One. And so it'll be a, zero, a uniform zero one. It turns out, here's a fact, there is, if I don't know anything about the problem whatsoever, and P is just randomly generated, there's not special rules to generating P in the first place, it just to be any number between zero and one you pick, I can learn it fastest on average if I pick alpha and beta to be a half and a half. So those results took a long time to prove. So Larry Brown over at University of Pennsylvania proved that I think back in the 70s. Isn't that just It is. And it has all kinds of cool properties. So let me just make some notes. Notes. Alpha is equal to one half. Beta is equal to one half is optimal. In some sense, anytime anybody says it's optimal, it sounds really good. It sounds like it can't be beaten. But they chose the optimality criteria. And so it turns out this is optimal in the sense of coming up with highest posterior intervals, highest posterior density intervals. We'll talk about those later and in estimating P simultaneously. It's also Jeffrey's prior, what Christina pointed out to us, which means it's transformation invariant. If I had decided instead of talking about P, I wanted to talk about one over P, it's just one over the probabilities. I change my model a little bit and I transform it to a scale that I like, my inferences are exactly the same. You'll notice that in every statistics class you've ever taken, if you transform something, it changes your answers. So it's desirable to come up with prior choices that are transformation invariant. That if I come up with this rule, whatever this rule is that Christina is specifying, it's called Jeffrey's rule, Jeffrey's prior, <coughs> derived from it, that it'll give me priors that are transformation invariant, that if you started with a different transform, of your parameter, so instead of learning p, I want to learn log p, log p over 1 minus p, or something like that. So log odds, maybe I want to learn that, just some other variable, I'll come up with identical inferences. And it turns out the Jeffrey's prior is beta half half. So we also get that. So we get all kinds of properties. So it's also shift and scale, invariant, it's par prior. And this all happens that we get all the pro these properties simultaneously because this is a one-dimensional problem. As soon as we start cranking up dimensionality in our problems, we can't have everything simultaneously. But it turns out in one-dimensional problems, you can probably have it all, most things. That's a beautiful thing. So later on, I'm going to make you choose your properties, which ones you want, because you can't have them all in the same analysis. That kind of makes sense, but it's also a little bit like, well, that's a bummer. But it's just an impossible thing. So this is optimal in some sense. It's Jeffrey's. It's a reference, meaning, and I'll say this, it's Jeffrey's, which means it's transform invariant. We'll come back to that in a couple weeks. It's reference. which means that it converges fastest. You have to, whenever you say something's fast, you're going to have to say, well, which metric do you use to measure the speed? And so this is in a pullback Leibler sense. And so it turns out it's the rule that pops out from it. It's also entropy, max entropy if you wanted to know. And if that just turns out to be something that might be a coincidence, I don't know enough about it because we've switched gears over the last 40 years to always talking about reference priors. Sometimes they align, sometimes they don't. And so in a lot of cases, you can't have all these things simultaneously. But in one-dimensional cases, you can get it all. This problem is also particularly easy because it's bounded. And so we don't have data all over the place. And it's fairly regular in the space. 
at all kinds of nice properties. So let's look at the posterior we get if we choose the beta prior. That's been really our only suggestions. Our other suggestion from the V is plug in some hyperparameters into that beta and turn it into a uniform. So our resulting posterior is P some of the X size. Write this down over on the left hand side. Proportional to P raised to the sum of the X size N minus sum of the X size times P raised to the alpha minus 1 times 1 minus P to the beta minus 1. And this can be simplified. P to the sum of the X size plus alpha minus 1 times 1 minus P to the N minus sum of the X size minus 1. So I've written down a distribution up to proportionality. Well, I used an equal sign right here. As soon as I used the proportionality sign once, plus beta. it's still just up to proportionality. Plus beta. Greater beta. Plus beta. Yes. Plus beta. Thank you. <clears throat> that kind of stuff regularly. So, but I, I can recognize this thing. I've already told you what a beta distribution looks like. It looks like this. This is a beta distribution. So this right here is a beta with parameters alpha and beta. This right here is a beta with parameters sum of the xi's plus alpha n minus some of the xi's plus beta. So if I do know properties of a beta distribution, then I know properties of this resulting posterior distribution. And so if I do know all kinds of things about my prior space, then I know all kinds of things about my posterior space. How are we updating the space? We're updating the space by updating this sum right here. So let me just ask real quickly, for a beta distribution with parameters alpha and beta, what is the expectation? Alpha over alpha plus beta. <coughs> Correct. It's the ratio of those two things. And you might even be able to tell me the variance. It's alpha, a trickier one. Alpha plus beta over alpha plus beta squared, alpha plus beta plus one. Check you out. So that's rare. <laughs> and so Annie's just taking a qualifying exam. And so she knows all these properties, ready to go. You could go to Wiki and look them all up, or the back of your textbook, or the back of any statistical inference book. And so, but this thing right here, alpha <coughs> over alpha plus beta, this expectation, if I did plug this in, right here, one half, one half, what would happen? The expectation would be a half. And so I'm not biasing anything. And also, I'm smearing mass kind of uniformly across the space, not totally uniformly, but I have a kind of even smear across the space with everything. If I plug in half and a half here, but our posterior distribution is going to come up with an expectation that's been updated. So the expectation of P given X, all of our data, and our parameters, usually we won't write these down, but while we're getting acquainted, we'll keep them in the equation. So this is going to look like sum of the Xi's plus alpha over N minus sum of the Xi's plus beta plus sum of the Xi's plus alpha. And so we have this additional influence of alpha and beta. So this looks like sum of the Xi's plus alpha over N plus alpha plus beta. So betas are kind of acting as penalties 
on what looks like a typical arithmetic average. So if you recall, the arithmetic average is just x bar, how we denote it, and that's some of the xi's over n. This is a penalized version of that. So we're getting a little bit of penalty coming in from our prior. And we can use that penalty maybe as an advantage. So let me show you a couple examples. So that's our first posterior calculation. So when I ask you to derive a posterior, I want you to name the posterior and tell me all of the parameters that drive that posterior. This is the beta distribution with these two parameters. So I've described the distribution. Let's see what it looks like. I want to first, before we start, I want to show you what the likelihood function looks like. But the likelihood function looks like a beta, the kernel of a beta. It's a non-normalized version of that. So I'm going to flip the point some number of times. Let's say I flip it 10 times, and we'll see how the likelihood itself evolves. And later on, we'll see how the posterior evolves. So I'm going to pick a truth. 0.7, so my true P is 0.7, and the number of times I'm going to flip the coin are 10. I'll show you my code next time in class. So here's my truth, 0.7, that's my blue line. I haven't flipped the coin yet. I'm going to flip it once, and there's my likelihood. Boom, the red line. It's my likelihood function. I could scale it up and down. I can multiply by any positive number. I chose to normalize these, so that the mass underneath added to one, that's not always possible. Can't always normalize the likelihood. But I chose to do it just for graphic purposes. And so what did I get right here? What is that line? That's P. That's just the equation P. I flipped it once, I got a success. And so what have I ruled out? I ruled out that my probability of success cannot be zero. Right there, P at zero, when I evaluate P at P is equal to zero, it's zero. So the likelihood of P being zero is zero. Absolutely ruled that out. Why? Because I saw a success. So probability of success can't be zero because I've seen it. The likelihood looks like a straight line. That's kind of cool. Let's flip the coin again. So I saw another success. So it's starting to bring down how likely values are below 0.1 thing that's pretty unlikely. I just saw two successes in a row. I doubt that P is less than 0.1. That's what this is establishing. And so it's going up as we go across. I've only seen two successes. Likelihood after another success is through is that it's arcing up. So this is just P cubed, the function that we see. Now I saw a failure. It totally bends this curve all the way around. That's phenomenal. I really like that. Betas are super flexible. Very flexy distributions. They can do a lot of things. They limit things that look like normals. That's not a coincidence. So I see another failure or another success right there. Keep doing this, march through, see what we get. Let's actually run that into the future just a little bit longer. We'll pause for a second. I have a pause command in here. So we'll let it pause for a second. Let's go 0.5 seconds. Let's run this thing. the likelihood just kind of bouncing around. What a Bayesian would like to do is penalize this likelihood slightly, regularize the space, and basically use its general shape to say where we believe the truth lives. So look at what this likelihood is doing. It's stacking up around the truth. And so it was skewed for a while. It was a straight line for a while. Had some weird skewness properties. And now it looks almost like a normal distribution. That's fantastic. Love that. 
and it's centering around the truth. We're seeing the central limit theorem kicking in. It turns out the central limit theorem is kicking in on all this. Keep in mind the sufficient statistic is some of the XIs. The central limit theorem says something about averaging numbers. So it converges to normality, the distributions. So this is Bayesian central limit theorem that we're seeing kick in here. But if I didn't know about the central limit theorem, I don't care if that's normal or not. It's some data, actually. And so asymptotically, it might be normal. Maybe I just don't even care. So I don't need to approximate anything. And so that's pretty cool. And if I kept running this infinitely long, I flipped an infinite number of point flips, this thing would converge to a point mass right at the blue line. Law of large numbers, again, central limit theorem, variance is decreasing. Lots of ways to prove that. Let's see what a Bayesian does. So slightly different thing. I've got another piece of code that will show you, and we'll talk about this next time, a hypothesis test. If you want to glance over to the left real quickly, I'm going to be testing this in the traditional classical fashion. I'm actually going to be using the cumulative distribution of the binomial distribution. I'm not doing the normal approximation. So these are actual exact key values that I'm computing, not approximate ones. Let's see what's going on. I have a little bit of code that I need to input. So I've got true P I need to put in, 0.7. I need to plug in my hyperparameters. I'm going to say a half and a half because I said those were optimal, so they must be okay. Number of iterations I want to watch for. Let's go for 100. And epsilon is going to refer to my hypothesis test. And so I'm going to be testing whether or not P0 is true P plus some distance away from that. We will go through that next time to get you reacquainted with what a P value is and how this one-sided test works. You can trust me, for right now, I've computed this correctly. So I'm going to plug in 0.3. We'll talk about that number later. Let's watch our graph evolve. It's gotten a head start on us. Two left panels. We don't need to watch right now. They're the relative frequency of everything. So what is x-bar doing? So where is x-bar going in all of this? The middle panel is a p-value, so it's cascaded to zero. It's saying reject the null hypothesis. It did it really quickly. We'll talk about that later. And the Bayesian is drawing this posterior curve. And what I've said right here is that in my legend, my posterior <coughs> is the dark line. In my likelihood is the dashed line. The hypothesis was one half here. The hypothesis is P plus epsilon. Let's talk about it later. Don't look at the left hand block. How about that? So you don't need to know what my hypothesis is for this. I haven't done a Bayesian hypothesis test. All I'm doing is drawing the posterior. So don't worry about the P value, the classical thing. We'll talk about that next time. So what I have is I have prior. Looks like this horseshoe shaped thing. And so, and that has some real implications. So I've said that's optimal, and what it's doing is putting a lot of mass on 0 and 1. That's kind of fascinating. You might wonder why you want to do this. And so, the likelihood and the posterior distribution have essentially converged to each other, and that's why you can't see it in that picture. So let's draw it one more time. Then we'll go, and we'll come back to all of this, and then we'll do another example. Can you make the figure bigger, like expand it? Yes. <coughs> you can see early, posterior and likelihood are a little bit different. They start to converge to each other. Posterior and the likelihood don't look anything like the prior anymore. So early in the analysis, when I just had one data point, my posterior looked a little bit more like the prior. Because I started to see more and more data, it started to pull away from it. If I look at this expectation that we're converging to right here, as I get n being big, this sum is getting big. And it's washing out the effect of alpha. And n is getting big, which is washing out the effect of both alpha and beta together. So if alpha and beta were very, very big numbers, it would take a long time to pull away from everything. Kind of see, we want some alpha and beta, we don't want them too big. But anyway, that's essentially what a Bayesian does. Let's come back next time, go through this, try to discuss what a classicist does, what the classical sort of p-value analysis are, 
what you get out of it versus what the Bayesian is giving you. And then I'll give you another example, and then I'll teach you about conjugacy, which I've inadvertently taught you about already. You'll notice that the prior and the posterior are both in the same families. They're both betas. When that happens, we say the prior is the conjugate choice. When it gives you the same family as the posterior. That's always unique. So you can't have two conjugate primes. Keep in mind, the likelihood's always fixed. So I don't get to wiggle that around and change it. Come back next time, look at more examples. Try to understand the difference between a Bayesian and what this whole p-value thing is, and everybody's always wielding. And then we'll get on with it.